I'd like to welcome everyone who has come today to send a sad farewell, but a wonderful remembrance of our colleague, Tom Barry. Tom will be greatly missed and will be greatly remembered. And to start this remembrance, and what this is, is a remembrance and a fond rem remembrance, I would like to introduce Tess Pantow, who will give us some words of comfort during this time. So, Tess. I don't believe in death, who comes in silent stealth. He robs us only of a breath, not of a lifetime's wealth. I don't believe the tomb imprisons us in earth. It's but another loving womb preparing our new birth. I do believe in life, empowered from above. Till freed from stress and worldly strife, we soar through realms above. I do believe that then, in joy that never ends, we'll meet all those we've loved again and celebrate our friends. We're gathered here today to honor the memory and celebrate the life of our dear friend and colleague, Tom Berry. May we all find comfort and peace as we share our fondest memories. Thank you, Tess. Many of you know Tom in many different situations, different histories and different paths that Tom has taken through his life. Many of you know Tom from his time working on the Hill. Uh, you know, Tom was very proud of the six wins that he had working in Congress. He failed to always mention that one loss, but I think those who were friends with Tom understood that, you know, you have to lose sometimes. But Tom joined NDI in around 2006 and worked first for a legend of NDI. Uh, I can only remember his, or his first name, Nelson, because I can never really say his last. Nelson Lesky, who, from what I've heard, and I've only been with NDI for three years, was a, a legend of his own. And uh, so Tom was successful in working with, with Nelson. And then as Nelson left, he had a new supervisor, Laura Jewett, and with that, new experiences by working in our field offices and working in Kyrgyzstan and Azerbaijan and Georgia. Then to come to the headquarters and working in our, our Asia region where Tom started working in a lot of other countries. And you know, I was looking and putting together of a list of countries that Tom visited. But I'm sure if anybody had visited Tom's house, you can see all the places that Tom has been. He's been in Nepal, Bangladesh, India, in a weird place that I don't think anybody in NDI has ever been before, or probably never will be again, Papua New Guinea. Also, you know, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan, that's not going to flow off my tongue. But Tom certainly made an impression wherever he went and collected things wherever he went. Um, Tom was a Fordham University graduate, uh, spoke finely always of, of uh, Fordham and his time there. But one of the most unique things that I had got to know Tom was uh, mysteries and thrillers. And Tom collected a mystery writer from the Netherlands in which he shared many different novels of this writer, and I became a, a fan of this writer. Um, so Tom was an important element, an important part of NDI, and will be missed. And what I would like to do now is, is introduce uh, a couple of people who uh, would like to acknowledge and, and remember Tom in their own words. And first, I would like to introduce uh, James Bombard, who has come to represent uh, Representative 
Morassic uh, for Tom's period of time working on the Hill. So thank you, James. Well, in addition to representing Bob Morazic, Tom was an old friend of mine. I first met him when he started to run Bob's campaign in 1982. And as a lobbyist for the state of New York and education and the veterans, I would come to Washington a lot, and I would always look up Tom. And we would always find our way to the, the hawk and the dove or the bull feathers. Or <laughs> and there was a guy named Chris Matthews who was worth Tip, Tip O'Neill's AA, who's gone on to bigger and better things, but he would be there tipping it with us. Uh, the Irish blood runs deep, you know. <laughs> but Bob is very sorry that he can't be here. Uh, he, uh, he's not feeling well. He's got some, something that's uh, sapping his energy, and he's not sure what it is. And he, he was very upset that he couldn't make the trip. And he lives in Ithaca, New York now, up by Cornell. So he called me and said, I, I have a letter I'd like you to read. And so I, I agreed. I used to get these uh, calls from Bob and Tom saying, hey, I, lived on Long, I live on Long Island, so it was his district. He'd say, could you make this presentation for us? And, and I said, well, give me something to go with. They'd give me two, two notes and say, you can do it. <laughs> but he was a great guy, Tom. This is a memory to Tom Barry by Bob Morazic. I regret that I can't be with you today to personally share my memories of Tom with family and friends. I first met Tom in the 1970s when I was incarcerated in the Suffolk County Legislature. <laughs> he wasn't in the jail. <laughs> and he was a skinny young Irish revolutionary with shoulder length hair. He was very idealistic and very serious. He told me that he wanted to pursue a career in politics. As the years passed, he learned the art of politics very carefully and very well. When I decided to run for Congress in 1982, Tom was my first choice to run the campaign. By then, he had a good job in Washington. I believe he was working for Jerry Ambrose, who was a congressman from the island at the time. But he gave it up to come back and help me. When we won, I asked him to become my chief of staff. At the start, I think he was the youngest AA administrative assistant in the House, but he was one of the best and an essential part of everything good that we accomplished. I'm proud that under his leadership, we had the same senior staff at the end of 10 years that we started with. Tom knew how to get to people to work together as a team. I was never quite sure it made him happy he came to enjoy good whiskey, fine cigars, nice clothes, and good conversation. Tom took life on his own terms and didn't suffer fools well. He had an exquisitely sarcastic sense of humor. <laughs> and anyone who knew Tom knew he had it. <laughs> that made me laugh out loud on countless occasions. I have one particularly vivid memory of him as I write these words. It happened when I was doing some work in the kitchen of our home on Capitol Hill. Bob Morazic bought Stanton, the Secretary of War Stanton's uh, house on, uh, on uh, I forget what street it's on. But it was a big old Civil War mansion and Bob was, you know, thought he could redo it. But uh, I think he finally gave up the ghost. But uh, <laughs> it happened when uh, I was doing some work in the kitchen of our home on Capitol Hill. It was lunchtime, and Tom had walked over from the house to discuss something that was pending in the office. He was wearing a navy blue pinstripe striped suit and looked like Cary Grant. He enjoyed dressing well. He was smoking one of his favorite cigars. I was trying to show my prowess as an electrician and had removed a live junction box from the ceiling that was at the end of a long length of steel cable. I had a plasterer there who was going to patch the area of the ceiling where I had made a big hole. I was holding the junction box in my hand when it somehow shorted. As I, sh as I received the shock, I hurled it away, and it flew straight into a plastic tray full of white plaster dust that had just been mixed 
A moment later, Tom was covered <laughs> from head to foot in white plaster dust, the cigar still sticking out of his mouth <laughs> as he stood there speechless. When my wife Kathy began to laugh, and it was impossible not to, he gave me a totally withering glare of disdain. <laughs> I can see him now, and it still makes me smile. I will always miss him, and the news of his death at such a young age was hard to take. May you rest in peace, my friend. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Raiza Tadad Hazal, who is together, okay, Raiza and Laura Jewett both worked closely with Tom. Uh, Laura as the uh, regional director for our Eurasia region, and uh, Raiza working together with Tom in our Asia region. So thank you. When um, the news about Tom's death uh, got out, uh, we received dozens and dozens of messages from Tom's admirers around the world. And we wanted to read to you just a few of them, some of them from people who are here with us today. I hope they won't mind us sharing their thoughts. Um, the first one actually comes from Jean Friedberg who wrote that, uh, I always appreciated Tom's earnestness and thoroughness, but underneath, I knew there was always that twinkle in his eye. He'll be greatly missed. I send you my heartfelt condolences and my deepest sympathies. From our former colleagues in Hong Kong, where Tom had traveled and worked with some of our teams there to do some program assessments. We received some messages from Belinda Winterborn. Just wanted to send through my condolences. I heard the very sad news about Tom's very sudden passing. Although I've left NDI close to two years, I still look back at the NDI days with much fondness. I still remember Tom and his super dry wit. It was always something we look forward to during those assessments. Always tease him, too, that he will always have to be forced to come back to Hong Kong until there's full universal suffrage. Please send our regards to the entire team. We are miles away, but we always think of you. From Nicholas Demeter, who worked uh, alongside Tom in field offices in Eurasia, Nick wrote, I'm sorry for your NDI, everyone's loss. Tom and I had some very good cigarettes together. <laughs> From Susan Page, who formerly was with NDI as Regional Director for Southern East Africa and is now the U.S. Ambassador to South Sudan. I'm so sorry to hear about the sudden passing of Tom Berry. Please give his family my condolences and let them know that I will be lighting in his memory a candle at St. Michael's in Juba, South Sudan. Rest in peace, Tom, and know that you are truly loved by many. From Johan Hamels in Belgium, this is really sad news. I had the opportunity to work, talk, sing, and laugh together with Tom. It's one of those things I will keep in mind. A good laugh and smile is the best bridge to build that global community for democracy. From Shayla Fruman, our former country director in Pakistan. I just read uh, the news sent to NDI alumni about Tom. Such sad news. I had very nice memories of Tom, especially at the time when he came to Pakistan, and we drove to Peshawar in those days when you still could. And we met with Dr. Kamal at the Shaheed Bhutta Foundation about our FATA work. Tom was very impressed with them and understood very quickly what they were trying to achieve. Of course, I took Tom shopping, and he loves the shops. And he bought a few things for his apartment that he had been looking for. He left Islamabad very happy. We also had some nice evenings at a couple of retreats, us old timers telling tall tales of our adventures. Tom had some good ones, as I recall. 
and we shared some good laughs that come from working in those places we have that can only be understood by the likes of us. It's times like these where we realize how much more connected we all are, perhaps than we realize it at that time. Even though I didn't know him well, I feel we were intensely involved in something that we never really talked about, but, but which bound us, all of us together, in unspoken and meaningful ways. And from Louisa Grave, who's here, and Nadia Duke at the National Endowment for Democracy. We would like to express our deepest sympathy to Tom's family and to NDI for your loss of a loved one, colleague, and friend. We're reeling from the shock and still find it hard to believe the news. Tom was for so many years a trusted and respected part of our world. And because of his dedicated work in far-flung countries, a number of different regional teams at the NED got to know him and appreciate his sure hand. Please accept our heartfelt condolences on behalf of all the teams at the National Endowment for Democracy. Thank you, Raiza and Laura. I would like to uh, introduce uh, Fred Summers. Fred is a long, t long time friend of Tom and would like to say a reflection poem. Thank you, John. I uh, appreciate you not describing me as an old friend of Tom's. <laughs> but good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Fred Summers. Um, thanks to all of you for coming today to help George and Carolyn and all of Tom's friends and colleagues in this celebration of his life and this remembrance of um, his special place in our lives. Uh, George and Carolyn had asked that I do a reflective poem, but as I want to do, I'm going to depart from the script a little bit um, and thought what I would do is uh, share a few thoughts that my wife Jeanette, who's with me today, and I have about Tom and um, our long-standing friendship with him. Tom Barry was uh, my dear friend, our dear friend, for over 30 years. I was originally introduced to Tom, um, fittingly for two Irishmen, at a bar. Well, we met at the bar at the National Democratic Club, where we ultimately spent many hours over the years critiquing the shortcomings of America's political class and coming up with elegant solutions to all the world's problems. I think Tom and I hit it off and became fast friends for many reasons. We shared a lot of things in common. Our Irish heritage, uh, we were both active in politics in college. We be both began our early careers working on Capitol Hill for members of Congress, uh, and we both managed political campaigns. And at the end of the day, I think one of the important things that connected us uh, was a common view that politics and public service were noble and important pursuits uh, that provide people with the opportunity to make a difference. Even a, um, a couple of guys like us from modest circumstances who never dreamed that one day we'd be uh, up working in Washington, D.C. We had many special times together over the years, uh, too numerous to mention them all, and some of them shouldn't be mentioned. Um, Tom was the enthusiastic host of my bachelor party before I was married, most memories of which thankfully escaped me at the moment. Uh, we enjoyed attending political events uh, together, particularly Democratic National Conventions, um, and the 1992 convention in New York, which nominated Bill Clinton and Al Gore, uh, where we were bunkmates at the Waldorf Astoria, and Tom showed me the meaning of the phrase, the city never sleeps, is a particularly memorable one for me. Uh, many camping and fishing trips over the years. Fishing, as you may know, was an avocation for Tom, uh, and there were many fun and eventful trips to the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia, sitting around the campfire, sharing food and good conversation, and wading into rivers and streams, pursuing those elusive fish. Um, Jeanette and I moved back into the district uh, a couple of years ago after being temporarily displaced to the suburbs for 25 years, and Tom took it upon himself to be our real estate scout as we were looking for a house. He made sure we knew the ins and outs of all the neighborhoods in the city 
and of course strongly encouraged us uh, to settle on Capitol Hill where he lived, counseling us on where we should look and sending us links to new homes that had recently come on the market. When we finally settled on a house uh, on the hill, Tom became our personal welcome wagon, uh, letting us know the best DMV offices to get our licenses and car registration, the best neighborhood blogs to monitor, and good restaurants and watering holes on Barracks Row and at Eastern Market. And of course, his commentary um, in introducing us to the politics of the district and the DC City Council was priceless, as you can imagine. The house we ended up in was seven blocks from Tom's house, so we were neighbors and frequent visitors uh, to each other's homes over the past couple of years. In fact, Jeanette and I dubbed 11th Street uh, the Tom Berry Expressway because it would take about three and a half minutes for us to get to Tom's place on I Street. Tom had begun, become quite the avid gardener after he moved into his home on the hill. And as Jeanette would say to me, Tom's very close to his garden, isn't he? He worked painstakingly to renovate his yard, laying new bricks, building new raised garden beds, planting scores of shrubs, flowers, and other greenery. And every time we visited Tom's place, he would give us an update on each new plant, telling us what it was, how it was doing, and what it eventually would look like once it bloomed. Now, remember, Tom's garden tour happened every time we visited. <laughs> He took enormous pride in his garden, and cut flowers and lavender from Tom's garden were special treats every time that he came over to visit us. To me, Tom was a very unique guy. He was one of the smartest people I've known. He was witty and irreverent. He possessed great wisdom, and he was extraordinarily kind and thoughtful to people. He was also a reserved guy. Uh, not a particularly demonstrative type, as you know, but under that reserved, almost shy demeanor was someone who immensely enjoyed people, who was big-hearted, and who had a true sense of adventure. When you were Tom's friend, you were Tom's friend, and you knew it. He was always there for you, whatever you needed, and he was someone who didn't have a need to talk about himself. He did like to talk, but he listened, he gave his advice if asked, and he didn't judge. Tom lived a rich and interesting life that took him from the corridors of power on Capitol Hill to fascinating places around the world. And as you look at his life and how he touched people along the way, the body of his professional accomplishments in politics, public policy, and the important international work that he did during his years here at NBI, he clearly made a difference in the lives of many people and left the world a better place than it was when he came into it. And in the end, isn't that the very best we all could hope would be said about ourselves? As I was thinking about today's gathering, I sent, uh, well, I shouldn't have looked at you. As I was thinking about today's gathering, I sent uh, Jeanette an email and asked, what are your fondest memories of Tom? She replied saying, <clears throat> I can only think about how I would miss the sound of his deep upbeat voice in my house. When, <laughs> when Tom was in the house, we knew Tom was in the house. We loved it. We had so many wonderful times together, sharing the latest news and making dinner together. We'd talk about everything under the sun from uh, politics to roof repair. Our times with Tom were effortless and fulfilling. It would be hours, and when Tom said, time to go, I wished he could stay a little longer. I think that captures very well our feelings about Tom. The times we were fortunate to spend with him were effortless and fulfilling, and we do wish he could have stayed a little longer. I'd like to close by borrowing from the movie uh, Waking Ned Devine, which some of you may be familiar with, and adapt some lyrics from the song Luke's Eterna, My Eternal Friend. Tom Berry was my great friend. 
but I don't ever remember telling him that. The words that are spoken at a funeral are spoken too late for the man that is dead. What a wonderful thing it would be to visit your own funeral, to sit at the front and hear what is said. Maybe say a few things yourself. Tom and I grew older together. At times we laughed, we grew younger. If he were here now, if he could hear what I say, I'd congratulate him on being a great man and thank him for being a friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. That was wonderful. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom's brother, George, who has taken the time to give us his thoughts about his brother. So, George. That was a tough act to follow. Fred and I have known each other for about 25 years. Um, I'm George Thomas Barry. I knew Thomas Vincent Barry for 57 years. Tom was a good son, a good brother, and a great friend. He started uh, in grassroots democratic policy in high school. He then worked for three congressmen before coming to NDI. He represented NDI for 15 years. Most people do uh, know that don't know that Tom was a camper and a regular fisherman for decades. He was going camping when he tragically passed away. He will he will always be remembered fondly, and missed always. And I have to say, he was my best man too. And I'll definitely forget about that party. <laughs> okay, do you want to say something? Yeah. So I'm the, uh, Carolyn, George's wife. And um, other things that, that uh, you know, actually Fred stole some of my thunder because he touched on so many things that I was going to talk about. So I'm going to continue a little bit. Tom, when he first you know, for so many years work, working in Washington, he had an apartment. When he first bought a house, George and I were so surprised. And then when he took to gardening, it was to us such a surprise because he was this man who was transient. He lived in the apartments, he traveled overseas. One of the first, aside from, from the time when I, I met Tom before we got married, George and I got married, um, uh, one of the, my first, like, really concrete memories of Tom was probably that 92 election. And after the debates, though, it was before the election, after the debates, he called me and he immediately, he wanted to speak to me, not George. What did you think of the debates? And I said, well, Tom, I said, you know I'm not that political. I don't really have much interest in politics. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I don't. <laughs> And he said, that's exactly why I'm calling you. What did you think of the debates? So we had this long talk about what I thought of the debates. And I came away from that thinking, all right, I probably failed, but that's OK. Later on in times when George had the, when Tom had the garden, he would call me to talk about his special plants, the fertilizers, because I grow orchids, the fertilizers that I would use and, and grow lights and all the rest of it. So I have so many memories of Tom. People have also talked about Tom, about his, his particularness. And I have a sense that the first time we visited his first apartment and we brought our dog, <laughs> I sort of think he cringed. <laughs> He liked the dog, and he was always, you know, and the dog was always welcome, but he always cringed. <laughs> Years later, when we brought that dog and the second dog, he threw up his hands. <laughs> and when he would visit our house, and we had the two dogs and the two cats, and if he left the guest room open, 
and he would find the cats curled up on his clothes or in his suitcase, he would just say, all right, you got a lint brush, probably. <laughs> so, so Tom was so particular, but he did so love the animals, our dogs, our cats. I know he shared bird pictures from his garden with so many here at NDI. And I know he shared so much about his garden with people here at NDI. Um, uh, there was, I wanted to get back to something else. There was, there was something, well, at any rate, uh, it's so, coming back to Washington today, yesterday, I can't imagine ever coming back again without thinking with Tom. He, in the early years, he took us in private tours of the Capitol. We have sat in the speaker's seat. We have seen so much of Washington that very few people who live and work here will ever see. I'll never be able to come back differently and see it without Tom there. Thank you for all being here. I obviously have uh, lost my brother, but we actually feel now that we're uh, a member of NDI's family. Everybody has some, been so good to us, it's incredible. John Palian has been with us even actually before anybody knew that my brother had passed away. Tess Pantrell is the daughter my mother never had and the sister I always wanted. I will always feel that way. Thank you. I'm still getting over the picture of Tom dressed in his starched white shirts camping. <laughs> Right, there's just, uh, there's a, a dichotomy there, but that is really reflective <laughs> of Tom. Well too. <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, it, it must have been, no, oh, the, the, yes, I can imagine. Um, I would like to take this time to introduce, uh, first, Ken Wallach, uh, president of NDI. Uh, Ken has known Tom, Tom's entire career here at NDI, and will offer his reflections. Uh, thank you, John, um, George, and Carolyn. I, I first would like to read a, a note that uh, <coughs> Secretary Madeleine Albright, NDI's chairman, uh, wrote, and it's on his way to, to you and, and to your brother, Christopher. Uh, we were all stunned by Tom's death. Um, it is an incredible loss for you as a family, by, but I must also add that it is a terrible loss for the NDI family. Tom was a most valued member of NDI. His understanding of all elements of democracy and his ability to translate his passion for teaching others about it cannot be replaced. He will be missed more than I can express. Words do not mean much at a time like this. Just know that we at NDI are grieving with you. And my deepest sympathies. Uh, uh, John, at the beginning, talked uh, just briefly about Nelson Ledsky, L-E-D-S-K-Y. <laughs> and Tom and their relationship. And um, I can only imagine that somewhere in a post-NDI retirement place uh, that uh, Nelson and Tom are plotting and making trouble. <laughs> During his 15 years at NDI, Tom's work, like few others here, spanned countries, regions, and programs. 
regional efforts in Washington overseeing programs in Asia and Eurasia, in the field directing NDI's work in Azerbaijan and Turkey, and programs that included parliamentary and political party development, civic participation, women's political empowerment, and election monitoring and law reform. In part because of his extensive experience in politics here and on Capitol Hill, his work, while always challenging, seemed somehow effortless. Friendships came easily to Tom, and his ability to quickly forge relationships and assess complex political environments were extraordinary. He was unflappable at times when others would be rattled, if not panicky. He forged strong bonds with courageous Democrats and even earned the respect of those who wanted to undermine them. He did not suffer fools gladly, but understood the needs, motives, and sensibilities of those with whom he and we partnered. His organizational skills were always in high demand. All of us were familiar with Tom's quiet demeanor, which masked a very dry, sometimes acerbic, even wicked sense of humor. <laughs> and his healthy skepticism, bordering sometimes on cynicism, never seemed to affect his deep and abiding dedication to a cause and to a mission. He believed in democratic politics and the democratic aspirations of people all over the world. And we will always honor that legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. I'd like to now introduce uh, Peter Manicus. Peter is our regional director for our Asia region and was Tom's supervisor. And uh, Peter will say a few words. Thank you, John. Although it's been almost two years, uh, two months since Tom passed away, when I come in each morning, I still expect to see him at his desk. It was a very well-organized desk. Everything was in his proper place. Tom was very fastidious in his work as well as in his attire. That's a good thing because we relied on Tom to keep us organized as well, to tell us what rules we had to follow and what deadlines had to be met. Tom's penchant for order seemed to stand in sharp contrast to his major interest in life, politics, hardly an orderly business. I think it was Tom's love of politics that drew him to NDI in the first place. We don't recruit many people like Tom anymore, and that's too bad because he brought a perspective that is enormously helpful to our work. I don't know exactly where it came from. Maybe it was his Irish heritage, maybe in his upbringing in New York. But politics was in Tom's blood. It seemed to come naturally to him. He could see the world through the eyes of a Tammany Hall ward boss. Tom made friends with political leaders everywhere, from Kathmandu to Port Moresby and Canberra. He not only understood them, but he spoke their language. He could talk about politics in terms that they understood. Shortly after Tom passed away, I received condolences from both major parties in Australia. The current leader of the House in Australia was especially fond of Tom. Tom had made friends on both sides of the aisle, a testimony to his ability to bridge political differences in pursuit of a larger goal. Tom was committed to democracy. He knew well the importance of having a political process that improved the lives of ordinary people. He mentored NDI staff and passed on those core values. He was emphatic and relentless in ensuring that NDI's programs took into account the political dynamics of a country and were realistic in what they could accomplish. 
He knew that democracy is often achieved through small victories, one, one at a time, and ultimate triumph is not assured. Tom, as you've all heard, kept a well-manicured garden in his backyard. It was as orderly as the top of his desk. Maybe there was no contradiction in his quest for order and his keen interest in politics. Perhaps he just wanted to bring a small measure of order to a disorderly world. We miss him enormously and will for a long time. Thank you, Peter. I would like to take this time to offer the microphone to anyone else that would like to take some time for a fond memory, a remembrance, an anecdote with Tom or about Tom. And I'm Laura Jewett. I worked with uh, Tom when he first started at NDI. His first assignment was to run the NDI office in Baku, Azerbaijan. Then, as now, uh, the challenge in Azerbaijan was to build two mutually exclusive sets of relationships, one with civil society and one and the political opposition and the other with the government. In the almost 20 years of NDI programs in Azerbaijan, only one person has succeeded in finding that balance, and it was Tom. He was a great political analyst, and he sent in really meaty field reports full of all kinds of hard-nosed assessments about who was doing what to whom. I pulled up, as I mentioned, some of his old reports recently. Um, and was impressed all over again with the sophistication of his insights and analysis. Not every political practitioner is also a good observer and writer, but Tom had that gift. Importantly, uh, sprinkled into these reports would sometimes be glimpses of a schmoozier, lighter side of Tom. Uh, for example, there were the periodic billiards games that he had with Siavush Naruzov, a ruling party MP, <laughs> and of course a legendary boar hunting excursion <laughs> with, I'm pretty sure, the uh, presidential legal advisor, Shaheen Aliyev, all of course in the name of furthering NDI's relationships. <laughs> There's some debate now about whether any boar were actually shot on that trip, much less consumed, but we do know that special tomatoes were procured to round out the recipe in case a boar was caught. And I could swear that there's a picture somewhere of that boar hunting. You have it? Oh, that's great. Please do, I would, I would love to see that picture. When I visit Azerbaijan now, people still ask me about Tom, government officials and NGO leaders alike. He is remembered with equal parts respect and fondness. Tom went on to run an NDI office in Turkey, and he did a great job there. But Turkey then as now was a big place where NDI was less of a sensation. Azerbaijan was more compact and also more rough and tumble. And I've always had the sense that Tom was most in his element when he was in Azerbaijan, where what he said and did really mattered. I believe those two years were a real high point for him. Tom, as others have said, had a stoic exterior. Uh, he was much more analytical than emotional, more left brain than right brain, and I think he also cultivated a veneer of detachment. But given his really impish sense of humor, he provided a very welcome touch of salt and vinegar. I don't think he would want me to say this, but Tom was also genuinely idealistic. He really believed in the democratic rights he was defending through his work with NDI, and his democratic compass was true. We'll miss him deeply.
My name is Steve Hirsch, and I knew Tom for many, many, many years. Tom also masterminded my bachelor party. <laughs> and um, let me just leave it at that. You guys know what I'm saying here? I will say this. I think that Tom would have preferred the bachelor party to have occurred in about 1963 uh, on 9th Street with with champagne and the kind of cocktails that we don't have anymore. But he really did his best. And, and I'll leave it at that. Um, I knew Tom both as, as, as a drinking buddy and as a colleague. And uh, I'm a journalist and, and as, as, as a fellow political guy. And I, 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 I think I knew him in, in, in more ways than a lot of people did. And he, he really was a great friend. Uh, he was a great political mind. Um, we agreed on almost everything. I think the only time we ever disagreed on anything political was on the success of reform efforts in Burma, which even in this group, I mean, there's probably only two people in here who, who care about that. Anyway, um, there are lots of stories about Tom I could tell, but the one that I, that I told uh, earlier this evening that I, I want to tell now, I went to Azerbaijan, and, and Tom was in many places besides Azerbaijan. That wasn't his whole career. but. I went to Azerbaijan as a reporter after Tom had been there. And I went there to do a story, uh, a newspaper story on legislative elections there. Tom called ahead, or telegrammed, or whatever he did in those days. And the, every time I walked into an office, either people knew that I was Tom Berry's friend, or if I happened to mention it, they'd say, well, have you ever been to Azerbaijan before? I'd say, well, I know Tom Berry. And I'd say, oh, well, sit down and have a cup of coffee. And they would be immediately forthcoming uh, with, with, with information on the basis that I was Tom's friend. Uh, Tom arrived a couple of days after I did, and you would think Bill Clinton had walked in the room. I mean, people were coming up and shaking his hand and throwing their hands, and he was doing the same. He really knew what he was doing. He understood Azerbaijan politics better than anybody who I knew at the time. And this was mirrored in his understanding of American politics, because I like all of us, talked to him about it forever. Uh, he and I then uh, uh, spent a Saturday night in Baku, which also need not be uh, 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 gone into too much detail here, so it was a lot of fun. He knew everybody there, too. Uh, he, he really, to me, he really, to me, he, he really is one of my closest friends. And it, 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 my heart stopped a little when, when I came in here today and saw the picture of him. Uh, he was a good guy. He was very funny. He was very private. I don't think Tom had many friends, but if you were one of his friends, you knew it. Uh, he didn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, and uh, if, uh, even though he liked mysteries, if you heard him talk about John Le Carre after he decided that Le Carre had gone south, you know he didn't suffer John Le Carre uh, <laughs> much either. Uh, he, he really was a good guy. I don't think he'd be comfortable here with us saying all this. But uh, I just want to say he was a very close friend of mine. He was a colleague, and I really will miss him a lot. And, and I'm, I think I speak for my wife, Betty, and me and that. Uh, my name is Bob Brooks, and I have known Tom. I knew Tom since I was at that bachelor party as well that Fred was talking about, uh, uh, incidentally. Um, I knew Tom. I met Tom in 1981. I had come to Capitol Hill about five years before that, and he was down here. Um, he was down here raising money or something for Bob Morazic's first campaign, and I came across and I came across in my button collection this button that he gave me back in 1981, uh, leading Long Island forward, Morazic. Okay, from the '82 campaign when he beat a fellow named John Laboutier, uh, and then Tom moved down here. Uh, and went to work for, for Bob for Bob Morazic and and uh, it's been mentioned uh, the work he did there. But what I noticed about him right away in his job was that he was the consummate professional. And I had been a chief of staff, and he and I were totally different. I'm from Seattle, Washington, okay, and he's from New York City or Long Island, and uh, you know we obviously had a different outlook on political life and how things got done. 
uh, uh, and um, but I noticed that he had that rare and unique and almost exclusively unique ability that all of us that were chiefs of staff, especially or AAs as we call them in those days, to young to newer members of Congress aspired to, and that was to understand both the po the policy side of all the issues and to understand the political side of what's going on in the district and how you balance these issues with getting your boss reelected and uh, nobody but nobody understood that uh, as well as Tom and I have yet to this day and I have owned a, uh, an advocacy company in this town for 32 years now to see somebody that was as good a chief of staff as him. He was, he was literally the best when he worked for Bob Morazic. And believe me, they were people who came running to him day and night with problems. I remember when the F-14s were trying to keep him at Grumman on uh, Long Island. And we used to come to him, and we, we, we worked for a client in there. We worked for Suffolk County, in fact. And I can remember running into his office running over there at quarter to eight, quarter to nine in the morning to get his attention on something, some rumor we had heard or something, you know, uh, how those things go. But uh, uh, he was also a very close family friend. The camping trips, George and Carolyn, I remember, remember well. He taught my son, along with Fred and George, to how to hunt snipe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I, my son is 30 years old and lives in Charlotte now, but he was very young. But when I called him up a couple of weeks ago and told him he was, uh, he, Jeanette happens to be his godmother as well, but he, w he was just devastated. I mean, he, he, could not, he could not believe it. And he sends his regards and his love to, uh, to, to, every, to you, George, and Carolyn, and everybody. Um, Finally, last but not least, and, and you know, when he left the hill and came down here, and you, everybody knows how it is in this town, where you kind of get out of your orbit, unfortunately, you don't keep as close to people, even though they're, they're in the same city, you don't keep as close to the people as you would, as you would like to, and especially when they're globetrotting around the world doing, doing stuff, it's hard to keep in touch with them. Uh, oh, thanks. But um, he did turn me on to the country of Costa Rica. In 1994, my first, which has become my second home, okay, but my first trip was there in 1994 with Tom and with a couple of other people who are in this photo from, unsurprisingly, a bar in San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, Tom on the left, me on the right, and a couple of other naysayers, uh, uh, ne'er-do-wells in the middle. But I'm just going to pass this picture around so everybody can look at it. It's on the wall of my uh, uh, and I wanted to share that with everyone and you know I will really miss Tom. Tom was the kind of guy where six or seven or eight people if you asked him well yeah who's your best friend well Tom Barry you know but he would never tell you who his best friend was but but uh, but he had if you were his friend as, as someone mentioned you were you were his friend and I had the honor of being his friend for for many years and uh, I will miss him greatly. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all so much for your kind remembrances. I'm still getting over the fact that he was a camper. It's just, um, I'd like to take this time to uh, introduce uh, Sherry Bryant, Sherry's NDI's vice president, for some closing remarks. Thanks, John. I'd like to close with a poem uh, that is one of my favorite poems, and it reminds me of uh, many people here at NDI, um, and Tom in particular, people who have uh, that I adventurous spirit to see the world and at some point come home. It's written by C.P. Kavafi, who was Greek, and he lived at the turn of the 20th century in Alexandria, Egypt. And this poem is called Ithaca. As you set out for Ithaca, hope that your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. The Lestragonians and the Cyclops, angry Poseidon, do not fear them. 
You will never find things like that as long as your heart, your thoughts are raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. The Lestragonians and the Cyclops, angry Poseidon, you will not encounter them unless you carry them in your soul, unless your soul raises them up before you. Ask that your journey be long. May there be summer mornings when with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you've never seen before. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, and perfumes of every kind, so many sensuous perfumes you can. May you visit Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. But keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better that it last so that you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained al along the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca wouldn't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understand by then what these Ithacas mean. So I want to thank you all for coming to this, I think, joyous day. And I hope uh, those of you who can stay a few minutes, we have food and beverage in the room right behind us, and we can all get to know each other a little bit more and say hello to Tom's family. Thank you.